Well, it's good seeing uh, so many old friends here again, and uh, it's my pleasure to speak tonight. I have to first, however, give a shout out to Sylvia Filippini Fantoni, who's in London right now talking at an international conference about museums in the era of participatory culture. She uh, liked the title of my talk and she said that she would shout out in London what I was talking about here. And also, also Shirley Mueller uh, is in Iowa City speaking about Dutch, t Dutch tea time and beyond. And so uh, right tonight we're having several people all talking at once. But uh, I'm happy to at least have one of the better audiences. Even though the conference in London is sold out, I'm pleased that you all braved coming here tonight. After my wife came up with the title, I realized that it may have sounded fun, but it is actually a bit too negative. Two thirds seem undesirable. Um, most things have been posited around here at work, so I've had to work a bit and sort of exhume some negative things from my memory about what has transpired here at the museum. My solace is that if you can't judge a book by its cover, perhaps a talk won't be judged by its title. So I'll talk about various experiences I've had while trying to obtain for the IMA some of the best art available. Art that I hope is good, um, in fact, more good than bad or ugly. In a way, this talk will be an inside or perhaps a behind the scenes look at some of the things that happened in the Asian department. Okay, so let me start at the beginning. After two decades of graduate school and having worked at a couple of other museums, I came to the IMA as an assistant curator in the Asian department. Then, then the Asian department consisted of one person, Yutaka Mino. And he thought for the centennial anniversary of the IMA, which was to occur in 1983, that one of the best things the Asian department could do to celebrate it would be to put together an exhibition and a full catalog of all the items that Mr. and Mrs. Lilly had given to the IMA. For it is their generous gift that really made the um, Indianapolis Museum of Art rise above the horizon in terms of uh, Asian art, or at least Chinese art. So I drove into work. This is the old building without Holman or obviously the, the uh, buildings in front. Drove right in there where we could park underground and I parked where the library is now, probably about where um, Alba's office is. I was delighted, I went to work, spent the day meeting some people, making sure my chair swiveled and my phone had a dial tone. And then I left to go home. So I pressed the elevator for the ground floor, which is now called floor one, and the elevator went up and then stopped. I pried open the doors and I realized that the ground floor was right about at my belt height. So I crawled out onto the floor and that was my ugly beginning to life at the IMA. I felt like it was some sort of birthing experience. While I was taking this picture, I noticed that the elevators haven't improved because it stayed with his doors agape for about 15 minutes. Well, after I was here for um, a little bit, uh, Dr. Meener asked me to look at a catalog of an upcoming auction uh, sale and see if there was anything good in terms of uh, paintings that might be acquired because there were several um, monies left over from some donation to the Asian department. And I noticed item number 68 by Fang Shun that looked rather interesting. And so uh, Dr. Mino put in a bid saying that we won't go above X thousands of dollars. And we won the bid, which was very good. We won it at the highest estimate which to me was sort of bad. You know, why didn't the bidding stop $100 below our maximum price? Or why didn't somebody take it one bid beyond the maximum price? But anyway, we got the painting. And when it arrived, I realized it was really a bit ugly. 
because there had been a lot of in-painting that had not been noted in the auction uh, catalog's condition report. In fact, the whole area right down here has been all uh, in-painted. It's still a good painting. You know, 95% of it is original, as are the inscriptions, but I was really irritated that um, this section had been in-painted. And that was really one of my first lessons at the museum after only a month or so here, was that you've got to see the original item before you go bid on it at auction. And I encourage you all to do the same thing. So speaking of auctions, there was a collector in New York City who loved to go to the auction houses and, and look through the previews of all the sales in the hopes of finding something that was overlooked, underappreciated, or wrongly cataloged. And he would often call up the museum and talk to Mino or myself, and we would discuss various items here and there. And one day he called up about an auction, I believe it was Sotheby's, and I noted several things that I thought were pretty good on the pages. <clears throat> and he said, fine, I'll get it. And I thought that was a really good idea. I told him, um, you know, just to ship it to us. And lo and behold, the package arrived. I opened it up, and I saw this there. And I said, but this is not the piece I told you to buy. You know, this was the illustration on the bottom of the page. I wanted the one on the top of the page. So I thought it was a rather bad case of um, unfortunate communications. However, I don't think it's ugly. And it's a nice celadon that fits nicely into a large group of celadons that the IMA already had. So this is the home of Mr. and Mrs. Eli Lilly. It's on, uh, I think, Sunset Lane. And I think in his will, he left it to the uh, president of IU Bloomington to use when he comes up here and IU Foundation also uses it. I should mention that all the art in this museum that the Lilies gave, most of it was given in 1960 and 61. It was given then, but it had always been at the museum. Uh, Lily never had uh, the art shipped to his home. He always had it shipped to the Heron Institute or to the uh, uh, IMA. He had it shipped here directly because the reason he purchased the art was so that the people of Indianapolis could enjoy it. They could come freely to the museum and then partake in what he thought was the beauty and tranquility of Asian art. So none of the things here had ever been in his house, but he liked Chinese art. So of course he had Chinese art kicking around his house. And so one day the IU Foundation called up the Asian department and said, could we come over and take a look at some of the Chinese items that are still in his house in case any are valuable and are you know, more than just sort of uh, knickknacks from China? And this I thought was a great, great thing. So we went over to the um, house and looked around and we found a couple of things upstairs in, oh, Watch me go backwards. We found a couple of things upstairs in the uh, party room, which is up here, and one downstairs in the closet by the front door. That's a bad place to store art. <laughs> and in fact, the one downstairs was sitting next to a pair of galoshes just like that. And I thought, boy, that's a really ugly place for a work of art. Well, the two pieces we found upstairs were these. The one on the left is a, a beautiful vase, a blue and white um, painted porcelain that dates to the early uh, 14, uh, years of the 1400, early Ming Dynasty. And it was sitting on a table, right in a coffee table, right in front of the couch. And Mino and I were aghast that if anybody had knocked, knocked it over or hit it, they would have destroyed many thousand dollars worth of art in one careless moment. So we quickly picked up that pace, piece and said, take it somewhere safe. And then we saw this, what I think is an amazing buffalo. Anybody could just drop it in their pocket and nobody would know. 
and I find this is an extraordinary buffalo. Um, Chinese have been making stone buffaloes from time immemorial, and uh, the number of jade, marble, and whatnot buffaloes, you can count in the hundreds, if not thousands. This one is absolutely, absolutely unique. Like so many of the lily items, what he collected always had something special about it. And I'd like to draw your attention uh, to the backbone of this animal. <clears throat> if you can see it go here and up around and then down and his tail goes behind him. So if you were looking down upon this little piece of jade, you would see sort of a uh, S-curving uh, type of a figure. Now, I've seen, as I said, at, at least many hundreds, if not a thousand, and I don't recall any other being articulated like this. Uh, even the uh, ribs are shown here, and the hooves are slightly uh, indented. Extreme sense of realism. Most of the Chinese buffaloes you see are like this one that Eskenazi has had in uh, London. He was asking one and a half million dollars for it. But they're all looking forward, either sitting on, on four legs directly or on the side, but then the tail always comes around to the front. So if you look down at it, you'll see what basically is C-shaped sort of an animal. And I think that is why most all these other buffaloes date from the Ming Dynasty from the 1400s and later, while this little piece that was sitting in the lily house probably dates to around 1250 uh, from the Sung Dynasty, making it one of the earlier pieces of a jade uh, in this collection, and certainly one of the earlier animal figures that is known anywhere. It's an extraordinarily fine piece. And then in the closet, next to the galoshes, we found this delicate glass bowl, extremely rare, um, dating to the early 1700s. I know of only a couple of other museums that have such a thing. Uh, there's one in the Freer Gallery in Washington, D.C. There's one in the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. And I think the Corning Museum of Glass has one. Uh, to my knowledge, not even the Palace Museum in Taipei has one. It's an extraordinarily delicate and finely crafted item and certainly doesn't belong next to a pair of galoshes. Lily also had several other items in his other house that is part of uh, now of Connor Prairie, a house called the Sylvan Retreat. And um, the director called me up one time and said, well, what should we do about these items? And I said, well, let me see them. I went over there, and again, I found about eight or nine pieces that were really top-shelf museum items. And I said, well, bring them to the IMA and let us look at them and evaluate it further. And she said, well, really, they belong in the IMA because that's where all of Lily's stuff is. I said, oh, that's great. You know, I'll even help you write a grant to Lily Foundation to um, perhaps get a kickback or they could get paid for them. And while they were here, they were borrowed for an exhibition in Cincinnati. And then, unfortunately, the director left, and the senior curator left, and the new admi administration decided to sell them at Bonhams in uh, San Francisco. Um, so rather than keeping Lily's material all together, which I must say for me was somewhat nostalgic, perhaps, uh, they turned them into hard cash and are using them now at Connor Prairie. I mean, obviously, they don't have much to do with the mission at Connor Prairie. But it was still, I felt, rather unfortunate that they um, couldn't be kept together with the other fine things that uh, Eli Lilly had um, acquired. Well, my boss moved on to the Chicago Art Institute, which was a good thing for me because now, was, now I was the Asian department of one person. I went to my director, then Bob Yasin, and I said, Bob, when uh, do I get to replace my old position? And he told me there was no replacement for my old position. And I thought, gee, that's a bad thing. And I said, why, Bob? He said, well, you had always been paid out of office furniture. You're not a salary item at the museum, which again sounded somewhat ugly to me. Then in the mid-1990s, when Brett Waller was uh, director of the museum, he sent out a charge to curators to suggest a wish list 
of significant acquisitions if we had, if we had a million dollars to spend. Think big, think something that really can improve the institution. So I said with in my head with a million dollars, I might as well go to the three most expensive dealers in the country, I mean, dealers that I've never been able to shop at before because now I had this imaginary wallet. Fortunately, they were all in New York City. So the first one I went to was Jim Lally. Uh, Jim, for many years, had been head of uh, Chinese antiquities at Sotheby's, and he knew everybody who bought any bit of Chinese art. He had a fantastic Rolodex. He knew all the uh, curators and all the collectors and the wealthy clients. And he recommended a European collection that he had heard might be for sale. It was the Pierre Aldry collection of Cloisonne. World-renowned, and it had about 400 items. That basically went from the early 1400s of the Ming Dynasty right up to the 20th century. Now, Cloisonne can sometimes be uh, difficult to look at, but this was an outstanding collection. Plus, it had a superb catalog that was written by uh, Helmut Brinker and uh, Albert Lutz. And the catalog to this day remains ba really the measure for dating Cloisonne, as well as the standards of quality for what is good and what is the so-so um, that your grandmother had as a cigarette container on her, on her porch. Then I went down the street. Well, I should actually say that for Jim Lally, he's still active, still there at um, the Fuller bu Building in New York City. And I encourage you, if you happen to be in New York, to go up and uh, see his collection because he really has every time and all the time museum quality objects and they're very accommodating and if you want to see some great art that's one of the best places to see it outside the, the Metropolitan. Then the other man I went to see was uh, Bob Ellsworth. Uh, many years before I went there in the um, mid-90s, Bob had been named the King of Ming. He was one of the greatest, more flamboyant um, art dealers around. He uh, had the collection, a complete clothing collection of Claudette Kober that he was always talking about. And he had just purchased for $10 million the Pan-Asian sculptural collection, mostly Indian and Southeast Asian. So I figured, well, you know, Bob might cut me a little deal since I'm from a small Midwest museum. And so I said, Bob, what do you have? I should also say that Bob is, um, started his career in furniture, loved woodworking, and has um, preserved the village in China that has all Ming Dynasty houses. It's basically the Williamsburg of China. It was a place that was so out of the way that, and had suffered such economic decline that all the old grand Ming Dynasty houses, 15th century houses, were still all there. They just needed restoration. He put together the only not-for-profit organization outside the USA besides Israel to support the reconstruction and the renovation of this um, a fantastic village. And to this end, he became an honorary citizen of the uh, People's Republic of China. The only other person to have that honor, which he was proud to say, was Richard Nixon. <laughs> anyway, he had a great collection of early lacquer. Lacquer from about 400 BC, and it was really quite astounding. There were carved pieces, there were decorative elements, there were drum stands, such as on the right. This is not the same items, this is just comparable items. But they were all beautifully painted with these swirling, fantastic designs, and of course the usual plates and platters and trays. And it was really a fantastic collection of lacquerware. Then I went to Leighton Longy, who deals only in Japanese art, 
And because he stands well over six feet tall, he calls himself the biggest dealer in Japanese art. He certainly has the biggest prices, and uh, I think some of the finest items that have come into American collection via American sources has gone through uh, his hand. Uh, Leighton is here on the left, and his wife, uh, Rosemary, is there in the center. He said, well, I know of a, a collector, uh, no, no, Alan and... Um, and Strassman, who have an excellent collection of Japanese painting, and they want to get rid of it because Alan wants to join his wife, who is interested in making and collecting contemporary art. So he figured he would jettison the Japanese collection. Now, the Straussmans say they like to move house every 10 years and build a new one so they don't get in this mode of settling down. Anyway, whatever his reasons were, they had some wonderful pictures um, that were available to be had. The three laughers here at uh, Tiger Ravine are basically a uh, Buddhist, Confucian, and Taoist individual. The collection boast, uh, consisted of about 80 hanging scrolls and folding screens that were in good and not bad or, nor ugly. And the trio um, here, I think, is part of the liveliness, uh, suggests some of the liveliness of the paintings that were acquired. So these were the three choices for the Asian department. Other curators had other suggestions. So a decision had to be made by the authorities on high. And oops, I see I have the wrong slide. The choice went to the Josephowitz collection of the Pontavon School, which was suggested by my boss, Ellen Lee, who was key in making the deal. And you see the good uh, Mr. Josephowitz there, and the other two you can figure out for yourselves. <laughs> Indeed, it was a grand collection, with many interesting works that merged well with the IMA's collection. And here are paintings by and of Charles Laval. Obviously had some great Gauguins and some landscape imagery, and it was really a wonderful um, acquisition that was made uh, in 1998. Well, fortunately, Brett was impressed with the, by the Japanese paintings, and he saw how well they fit into the IMA's collection, relating as they do uh, not only to the Chinese uh, painting collection, but also they related to the European collection because they came from the Edo period, the same time period when many um, European artists were drawing influence from uh, Japanese art. And he was quite taken by this collection and, and thought it looked pretty good. However, it took some time. It took two years before Brett could find a way to acquire it. And during those two years, Leighton Longy, hot-blooded Italian that he was, was just tearing his hair out. He would call me up once a month. How's that decision coming? How's that decision coming? And I guess one time he called Brett even, because I said, you know, let me you know, run interference. And I think Brett said something to the effect that, if you need an answer now, the only one I can give you is no. But if you wait for a while, I might be able to say yes. This drove him even more crazy. And he said, well, I'll give you a couple more things if you can make the deal by the end of the year. And he was just frantic. But anyway, fortunately, Brett saw a way that he could come up with a yes. And the IMA dipped into its acquisition funds to acquire the collection. And in gratitude for his efforts on this part, the Asian Art Society purchased the painting on the left and gave it to the museum in honor of uh, the director, Brett Waller. The painting on the right is one of the more magnificent items there. I think it was once owned by the doctor of the Emperor of Japan. It's one of the largest, most colorful painters, 
paintings by the same man who did the uh, three laughers we saw, a very somewhat eccentric but extremely beloved and uh, expensive artist. The acquisition was recognized by Apollo Magazine, the international arts magazine that's uh, published out of London, as among the best museum acquisitions in 2000. And this was a really good thing. Now, this is one of the fine pieces, a small little album leaf that is uh, mounted as a hanging scroll. Brett, Wall Brett Waller also realized that the Japanese collection had reached a critical mass and needed a someone knowledgeable in that area to take care of it. And thus the present curator of Asian art, John Terramoto, was hired. And I think this has turned out, as I've often said, to be the best acquisition I've ever made for the IMA. Though the Chinese collection had always been the largest and most important part of the Asian collection, the Japanese painting was now far larger than the Chinese painting collection. Being a sinologist, I figured, well, this time to even things out here. As several good Chinese paintings at modest prices came to my attention, but because the IMA had actually done more than dip into its acquisition funds for Jap the Japanese paintings, all the paintings I suggested were deemed too expensive. This is one example of a album of painting. I think there are eight uh, paintings in all. The artist did this near the end of his life in 1644, which was also the end of the Ming Dynasty. And I think this one example, which I thought was every bit as much a reduction of landscape to planes and forms as what Cezanne would do about 250 years later, was a good enough reason to acquire it. It really showed, I thought, how, uh, well, how different cultures approach things at different times. I won't say one is more advanced, just that at different times people in different cultures were working with different obstacles in their painting repertoire. Then one day I got a call from a dealer, an American living in Japan, who said, he had heard that we had acquired a lot of Japanese paintings and wondered if we would uh, consider buying some really good paintings for a change. He was selling some Chinese paintings and he knew of a uh, collector who wanted to sell his collection and wondered if we could acquire it. Not only did it include some of the modest priced paintings I had considered earlier, which were deemed too expensive, but it included some great compliments to the IMA collection. The painting on the left is one that the Lilies gave to the museum in uh, 1960, and the one on the right was part of this uh, collection of paintings that this dealer said could finally bring some good art to the museum. Like, dealers tend to be somewhat positive about their own uh, objects. This now much larger group of paintings was more than two dozen, was definitely way beyond the means of the IMA to buy. But luckily in 2004, the Lilly Endowment agreed to help because so many of these paintings complemented those that Mr. and Mrs. Eli Lilly had given, which formed the basis of our collection here, in, at least of Chinese art. Now these two painters that did these different paintings, I mean, obviously they're similar in terms of pose, but they're two completely different people. And the artist on the left was a sort of a wild and eccentric character from Southeast China. The fellow on the right was from uh, Beijing, from the capital, and he was a court painter. One shows a mythological figure, a figure from a, a great poem of the Tang Dynasty, a courtesan who was you know, kicked out of her job, which was playing the lute, because she had grown old and was no young, longer young and beautiful. And thus her head is downcast. And I think that painting is one of the finer paintings to understand what really is 
Chinese brushwork and what is the meaning of calligraphic line. The one on the right is of an immortal giving an offering. The painting, I said in the inscription, was um, requested by a son for his mother's birthday. And I also find this one a fantastic I, um, image of um, brushwork. You know, they both have this fan that they stand in front of them, like today's models with the, the waving uh, uh, costume trails behind. But what it so intrigues me about the one on the right is that the tree that's there. I mean, this is a solid tree that keeps us from entering the paintings. Most Chinese landscapes always have a path that you can wander through. You're supposed to get in. But this tree, I find, keeps us from thinking about physically going to the land of the immortals. We may see it, but we cannot step onto the plateau that she has, had, that she has stepped on. This acquisition um, I thought was very good, but in the um, history of the IMA, which is called Every Way Possible, that was written uh, four years later, the acquisition wasn't mentioned. And perhaps that's a bad thing, but nevertheless, the paintings weren't ugly. This one painting here by John Fung uh, shows a man, and you can barely recognize him here, standing over a cliff Whistling. Whistling was a great Taoist sort of practice, and uh, there have been long poems about the benefit of whistling. It has something to do with breath control and whatnot. As some people translate it as howling, but that is sort of unpleasant to the museum audience, so I think whistling is better. This had been on loan to the Met and was a reason the owner had been invited to sit on the Asian Acquisition Committee of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And when the Met curator saw it here during a visit, he just groaned, which made me feel very happy. Many works of art come to museums that you see via dealers. And this is partly due to the fact that dealers can bring items to our attention and because dealers move slowly, as museums do, which is not the case with the uh, fast-paced auction house market. So I'd like to finish up talking about a particular dealer. Um, and it's a dealer that both Mr. Lilly and I knew and dealt with. I never met Mr. Lilly, but we both met and used the same dealer. Indeed, the dealer had been supplying art and resources to the IMA for more than 50 years, from at least 1950 until his death in 2007. Walter Hochstadter is his name. And Walter, I think, one day deserves more than a mere mention in a talk, perhaps a book will focus on this man. One dealer and scholar who, who knew him well called Walter, quote, friend and foe in one incomparable enigmatic mix. Noel Giafida, who is writing a book about the acquisition of Asian art at the Cleveland Museum of Art, which is one of the best ones in the nation, um, and the, the role that Sherman E. Lee played in building that Asian collection. Uh, and she says, Walter and Lee had an interesting and tumultuous relationship. I first met Walter in the early 1980s, and by the late 1990s, most of the art world, curators, directors, and dealers alike were amazed that I could still tolerate him. Idiosyncratic, to say the least and I'm sure he became more and more so over the years. From 1951 to 1994, more than 40 items came to the museum through his hands, but we were not his only clients. Looking through his papers, which have been uh, digitized by the Leo Beck Institute in New York City, it is clear that he dealt with most 
if not all museums that have Chinese art. Walter added to the collections from Stockholm and Berlin and the British Museum to Hong Kong and even the National Palace Museum in Taiwan and virtually everywhere in the US, from Boston to the Met to the Freer Gallery on the East Coast to LA, San Francisco and Honolulu on the West and all places in between. Even small collections of Chinese art, such as the Toledo Art Museum or the Buffalo Museum of Science have items that came from him. And every curator and scholar admired his eye and marveled at his precise photographic memory. You know, he could remember things in the present that he saw 50 years ago, 60 years ago, when he was first in China. He also not only supplied things to collectors like Eli Lilly, but also to Senator Theodore Green, who amassed a large collection of paintings. His niece, you may know, uh, Betsy Roberts, Mrs. John H. Roberts, um, gave many paintings to the IMA, and most of them were given to her by Senator Theodore Green. Well, getting back to Walter, he left Germany and went to China in the mid-30s. In 1938, he immigrated to the US and he worked tirelessly to get his parents out of Nazi Germany, and he devoted his life to rescuing art. First from the chaos in China before the 50s, when everybody was on the move and the wealthy realized they were in trouble and they were trying to raise cash, the opportunities must have been limitless for him. And then, more recently, from dealers and collectors, whom he thought were idiots and who could not appreciate the fine subtleties of Chinese art. We were speaking of Tom Keebler earlier um, in an Asian art seminar that we held many years ago. This is the one painting that made Tom Keebler become interested in Asian art and uh, started him acquiring uh, so many things. And going through some of the institute findings, I was able to find some of the comments <coughs> that uh, Walter Hochstetter wrote about art. This is a hand scroll by a Yuan Dynasty artist, uh, Zhao Mengfu, that was painted about 1300. In speaking about the, tree, uh, the entire composition, he says, the trees look stilted and artificial. The repetition of the weak outlines of the distant hills on the left, superimposed one upon the other, is particularly feeble and unimaginative and would not occur in good painting. He was rigorous in his uh, research on these paintings. So he tore into the seals and the inscriptions. And he found many places where the, um, as you see his circle here and up here, um, where these uh, characters, or the, um, this part of the inscription, was omitted from antique catalogs that meticulously transcribed the holdings of uh, particular collectors. He also found seals on it of collectors who had catalogs. He looked through that catalog and then couldn't find the painting. Now, some people excuse this by saying, well, the catalog went to press and then he got the painting. So not all catalogs uh, then or even now can remain completely uh, current. In speaking of the brushwork, he says, the brushwork is decidedly mediocre. The worst details are the stiff, graceless tree, tr tree trunks drawn in wobbly outlines with a limpid branch hanging straight down on the right, which would be this one here, and another feebly zigzagging out toward the left. Do, 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 do. These are all comments he was making uh, while preparing to uh, create a comprehensive catalog of Chinese paintings. And his comments, though often harsh, 
He never cared who heard them, nor how people might feel when they heard them. To sum up on this painting, he said, the uniform, pathetic praise bestowed upon this clumsy concoction over the past 20 years appears to be symptomatic for an attitude towards Chinese painting which considers sound analysis and serious examination a superfluous nuisance. Now here, of course, he's commenting on every living scholar in the field who to this day consider this painting as being one of the great paintings that was made around 1300. Sadly, he never finished this book, so we don't know his comments about other bad paintings that have been accepted as canons of uh, art in, uh, in China, nor what he would propose to be some of the canons. Uh, surely, some of his proposed paintings undoubtedly went through his own uh, hands. His requests for photos are legendary. He was always badgering curators and directors and folks, oh, I need a copy of this painting, or can you give me a copy from this book? And when I looked uh, through his archives and saw that all the photo request forms or permission forms that had been sent from museums, the Fog, the Smithsonian, he meticulously crossed off that last line that said so many copies had to be sent to the institution and then initialed it. When he saw the installation of the Chinese galleries in the 80s, he was aghast. We had used risers um, to put underneath most of the objects to elevate them. Square risers, round risers, low risers, high risers. He took one look at it and said, this looks like a damn calliope. And I wish I could mimic his German accent. But he was extremely upset. Mino and I, we enjoyed using risers because we could stuff more things in the gallery. We could use a riser as a backdrop and put something in, un in front of it. And so it'd still be nicely illuminated. And so we could almost put two and three levels of items. Walter said the vessels all come with their own risers. The artist himself decided how far off the table a vessel should sit or stand. Were the legs to be this tall or that tall? The foot on a piece of ceramic, tall or short? I thought he was absolutely right. I remember that when we were using risers, we tended to think in terms of, does the case look good? Is it balanced or unbalanced? We never thought about, do the items look good themselves? So Walter was also, as I said, responsible for many of the IMA earliest and finest paintings, such as this rare hoary landscape on the left by Lee Kahn, and this fine flower and bird painting from an artist who revolutionized the genre from the perfect, sometimes uh, idealistic naturalism, realism of the Sung Dynasty. Wang Yiran broke the tradition of having to have likeness be the sole criteria for art. And I'm sure Walter could look at this tree and he wouldn't find any graceless tree branches zigzagging or hanging limp or feeble uh, branches. We got a fine hand scroll of 24 flowers. Fortunately, it was originally intended for Toledo, but it came here. And then perhaps the greatest painting, or at least the most well-known painting in our collection, the Three Catalpa Trees by Shen Zhou. <clears throat> Shen Zhou was one of the greatest masters of Chinese painting, and uh, this painting is the most often reproduced and requested, I think, in our collection. Walter handled several uh, Shen Zhou paintings, <coughs> including a fine album that is now in the Cleveland Museum and an album that is discussed in his article or his, uh, his um, contribution to this journal 
published in uh, 1959 and 60. And in speaking of another Shunjo painting that the Cleveland Museum has, <clears throat> which is a large bird and flower painting, he sold him the small album, which was the focus of the real Shunjo. He wrote, to believe that Shun Zhou did a brightly colored hanging scroll of gigantic proportions is indeed an incredible assumption. Yet nothing appears too queer and too impossible not to find a champion with an explanation. This is one of the more famous paintings in the Lily Collection. This is by one of the four masters of the Yuan Dynasty. These were the four great painters who revolutionized painting and who were the model for the following 600 years in Chinese art history. These were the paragons. And the painting on the right by Wang Meng <clears throat> may be one of his best paintings in the United States and indeed perhaps outside of China. Now I began researching this painting, of course, when I was working on the uh, Lily catalog because it had gone through the hands of Walter Hochstetter. <clears throat> and I noticed that there was a uh, reproduction in the late 1940s. And I figured I'd better go look at the reproduction of the 1940s. <clears throat> the reproduction is on the top, of course. And I apologize for the green that the uh, fluorescent light seems to give to my telephone when I try to take a picture. But I looked closely at it, and I noticed there was a rather difference. <clears throat> this area here has no painting. I mean, it's washed out. But this area here is fully painted. This, as far as I could find, <clears throat> was the only in painting, and I'm back to that word of the first painting I showed tonight, that occurred here. And here I'm, I'm really lucky that it's only this little bit. Uh, Walter himself was an artist. Uh, he was more bent on German expressionism than Chinese painting. And uh, there was a written comment by a Chinese collector who thought it was outrageous that um, a Westerner should do such a thing. In painting happens all the time in Asian art. And every time I go into conservation in this museum, I always see a conservator with a paintbrush <clears throat> tarting up some painting. But it doesn't happen that often. Fortunately, not much had been changed. Walter is well known for removing bridges or clouds from paintings, as well as removing and adding signatures and seals when he felt, as in the words of Jim Cahill, uh, a great professor of Chinese art history at, at Berkeley, and as Cahill said, except when he felt he was, quote, cleansing the Chinese painting world, then he would do what he wanted. Uh, he would cut a hand scroll in half and sell half to Honolulu and half to um, um, Cleveland. Albums, curators are still trying to put together albums that he would sell four leaves here and five leaves there. It was an extremely uh, vexing situation. And ceramics weren't the, I, I mean, paintings weren't the only things he, he played with. Um, ceramics, he would forever filing off the feet <clears throat> or the little mound of glaze so the object would sit perfectly flat and not have any sort of wobble to it. He offered me this, uh, small amphora made about 4,000 years ago. <clears throat> and he said he was washing off some horrible design that some fool had painted on this beautiful jar and got into an argument on the phone with some curator who didn't know anything about Chinese art. And when he got back, the entire outer surface had washed away. So he thought this might be good for our painting collection, uh, for our ceramic collection, because it shows the interior of a Neolithic ceramic, where it has this frit made of quartz, the white particles you see there. This all would have been covered with a very fine levigated clay 
so it has that very smooth appearance on the outside. And lots of people think they're not sturdy enough, but having the, fortunately, having the outsides removed by Walter in his bathroom sink, you can see that these things are actually made with firm clay and lots of grit and quartz to hold them together. I'll go on one more. A hand scroll that has was, just came down and that was in the past rotation of the yaksha lifting the bowl. I, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with this, but there's a, a little baby here and under a, a crystalline bowl and the Buddha here is uh, fending off all the attacks by the evil folks. Walter got this from C.C. Wong in Shanghai in 1949. Now, C.C. Wong was a great collector of Chinese paintings from a great family that had a huge collection, I mean, hundreds of really high-quality paintings. Um, his paintings are basically the source of the Metropolitan Museum's painting collection. Many are uh, dispersed through you know, the Freer, and I think we even have one or two. So he got this in 49 and paid for it in 1950. And CC and Walter, like everybody else, had a love-hate affair. So <clears throat> they were always trading paintings back and forth. And you know, one of the great stories about Walter is the court case filed in 1956 where he accused C.C. Wong of duping him with a fake. Sherman Lee went down there to testify, and he said it was the most humiliating thing. He said, Jim, never testify in court, because you know, Sherman Lee would say, well, this line doesn't work right. And the prosecutor would say, well, should it turn on a light, or what should it do? And so he said, you can't talk with people who don't understand art. But anyway. Even C.C. Wong felt he was going to lose this court case, that the painting might be considered a fake <clears throat> and that uh, Hochstadter would win. But the judge finally asked, in talking to Hochstadter, he says, well, who knows more about Chinese paintings than you do? And Hochstadter, in his small voice and German accent, nobody, most of them are fools. They don't know anything. So the judge said, well, if you're the best authority, how could you have been duped? <laughs> he lost the case in 56 and dropped his American citizenship the next day. Walter, I think, embodied the good, the bad, and the ugly in one persona. He had many good items and a great eye, but he had a temper that was so bad that the merest annoyance could displease him and it often prompted rude actions and words that were absolutely ugly to anybody who bore witness to it. Everyone has many stories about Walter, which is why I think he would be a great subject for a book to collect them all, but that's a story for another time. Thank you. And I was told to ask if anybody might have a question. Yes. Yes. It still is preserved, and there's a big monument that tells all about um, Bob Ellsworth's contribution. And one of the major contributors was that uh, collector in New York who brought the wrong ceramic for me. It's up in Anhui province and is, is worth a visit. It's really the Williamsburg of China. Most every other place, as you even know in Beijing, you know, they're tearing down all the old hutongs and um, it's the one place to see Ming Dynasty China. Yes?
Well, war often gets things moving. Um, people want to sell things to get out of China to raise currency. Uh, even Walter was um, selling many items that he later regretted. He was selling them at such cheap prices, but he was trying to get his family out of um, Nazi Germany, and he, he was successful in doing so. Um, I'm sure every war has you know, different impact on art, but uh, it does free up a lot of art. I mean, the Japanese went into China, and that allowed them just to steal and take a lot of things back to Japan, which formed the basis of, you know, many strong collections in Japan that had um, Chinese art. Do curators worry about that? Um, in a way, I didn't, at least in the past. I mean, I think morality has changed quite a bit now. Um, Bob Ellsworth collection of uh, lacquer would be very difficult to get by any serious museum because there is no ancient provenance, that it hasn't been out of the country for a long time. I'm sure Bob could produce export papers because he knew everybody. In fact, he was an honorary member of the um, Committee of Cultural Antiquities in China, so I'm sure he could have produced the proper papers. Um, but generally, it's much harder now to deal with things from the war zones. Yes? I think it's very good, but I must say I'm going to go back uh, with some free time not a, that I don't have to prepare this talk and look a little more closely. Um, it has the imperial seals on it and when I looked it up, it's now at the Met. When I looked it up at the Met, they don't brag about it being recorded in the imperial catalog. So it would be strange that it's not in two important catalogs. Uh, there's an identical, almost an identical copy in uh, Oberlin, I believe. And that's the Xerox book that Walter had been working with because it had the two paintings together. But accepting the Oberlin painting as the copy, there were such telling differences between that and the New York painting that it was compelling. And the, the other, I think, ace in the hole is that uh, Zhao Mengfu was not necessarily painting likeness. That he was just the first one who broke away. He began a tradition of what's called, uh, sometimes translated as clumsiness, um, lack of sophistication, and I think that may just be part of it. So it might be a good painting after. I'm on the good side of it, but maybe time will tell. Well, thank you very much. Oh, one more in the back. Whoa, that's tough. <clears throat> Would well, have to be something like the Palace Museum in, in Beijing or Taipei because it's so, so large. Um, the British Museum has uh, acquired the Sir Percival David Foundation uh, ceramics, and so the British Museum now has uh, stunning galleries. And there are good museums all over the world. And in Paris, there's a Musée Guimet and the Musée Chernutsi, which is uh, very good. Even Athens has a Banaki Museum that has a couple of Asian items. And of course, in Istanbul, you've got the Artable Shrine and the Top Kapi Sarai, which has the largest collection of blue and white ceramics. So you know, it all sort of depends on what country you want to go visit. <laughs> well, thank you very much.